stand on this X, I'll be able to see the screen and still talk and have you hear me. Uh, can we have the first slide, please? A few years ago, I wrote with Fred Singer a book called Unstoppable Global Warming Every 1500 Years. The Dansgaard Oshker climate cycle that moved from global warmings to global coolings in a long natural pattern. We haven't known why that pattern occurred, but we knew that it did. And after I finished that book, I began to wonder what happened to all those ancient cultures that collapsed? And when I started looking, I discovered they all collapsed. And I'd like to share with you today some of the details on how they collapsed and the impact that it produced. But the theme is war in the cold. These are ancient Chinese warriors. No nation has had more wars and rebellions than China because it's vulnerable. Its food production is especially vulnerable to climate changes. This is the Thirty Years' War in Europe in the early 1600s when Protestants were fighting with Christians about who had the correct understanding of God's will. Eleven million people were killed in that Christian conflict. This is Napoleon's army trying to retreat from Moscow in one of the worst winters in all history. I think something like 1,800 of his troops got back to Paris after that winter. All of these wars occurred during Little Ice Ages. Most of the ancient conflicts occurred during Little Ice Ages. Why? Shorter growing seasons, cloudier sky, untimely frosts, extended droughts as much as 350 years without rain in a region. When you've had that long a drought, if you get rain, then you get a flood. Noah's flood occurred in Mesopotamia about 2900 BC. The heavier floods drown farmers in their fields. This pattern creates crop failure across continents and around the world. They couldn't feed their cities, and often you got war as a result. I'm having trouble seeing this, yeah. Oh, just about, yeah. 80% uh, of China's tumultuous wars occurred in its little ice ages. Uh, one of the cute things was locusts. We've discovered recently that locusts love a pattern of alternating droughts and floods. It's a complex biological thing, but it produces more locust damage, and that's China's most destructive insect. Epidemics. The bubonic plague always occurred during droughts because the fleas live on the rats and voles out in the Chinese west grasslands. When there's a drought out there, all the rodents die, and all those fleas are looking for new hosts. And they're spread by traders and trading ships, and it goes worldwide. When people can't eat, they're unhappy, more likely to have rebellion, and very often invasions. China in the cold, 1600 to 1899, that's almost a thousand years. 243 wars, 267 rebellions, 81 major floods and droughts, and 40 natural calamities, including typhoons, epidemics, and 
maunder minimums. Deadly. Let's look at Europe's war peak in the 17th century. The Thirty Years' War, 11 million deaths, nothing resolved. Finally, both sides agreed to coexist with each other. But look at this chart of food prices in the Netherlands from 1200 to 1900. You see a small peak there at 1300. There were four massive sea flood disasters in the Low Countries and the German coast within 40 years when the Little Ice Age began. Flooded crops, drowned people, terrible inflation in food prices, which was nothing compared to 1590 through 1610, which had the worst harvests of that whole period and drove the price of food radically higher. You can't have food prices that high without massive starvation, broad gauge famine. And then in the 1800s, we had another solar minimum, and we had, that was the Dalton. You had very cold weather, unstable weather, Europe in the 17th century general crisis, the Thirty Years' War, as I've said, trampling armies, fleeing farmers, displaced people. And Europe also in that period got the Black Death. It had begun in the 1500s, but it spilled over into the 1600s, killed 30 to 60 percent of Europe's population over three centuries. As I mentioned, that always starts with drought in China, the fleas coming west to spread death through Europe, and we had a series of major outbreaks during the 17th century. Bubonic plague victims, no treatment, no prevention, nothing but wailing. In China, the population dropped 43%. Again, this is the 17th century. 1620 to 1650, extreme cold, floods, famines, wars, rebellions, and blue bubonic plague. Chinese famine victims getting the small amount of food aid the government had to pass out. Global war peak in the 19th century began with the Napoleonic Wars from 1804 to 1813. Death toll four to six million. Major rebellions, of course, across Europe in the famine times. The Crimean War involved four major countries. These are the British troops waiting for the charge of Napoleon's Grand Army. As was mentioned in this morning's program next door, we have finally gotten the human food supply past most of nature's quirks. We began the technological revolution in farming during the Little Ice Age. During the second half of the Little Ice Age, we traded crops and livestock around the world. Almost every country got better food productivity as a result. And that technology, the search for farming technologies that began then, crop rotation, better plows, so forth, carried on through until today. And I had the pleasure of working with Norman Borlaug toward the close of his career when he was trying to bring a green revolution to Africa. Never achieved that, but the search was an important beginning. 
Now, as Craig has just pointed out, we aren't done yet. We're going to have to nearly double world food production again before the population decline begins about 2060. We're predicting 8 billion people by 2100, perhaps 3 billion people by 2300, because richer people have fewer children because their children don't die. But we have to get through that peak food demand period, biotechnology, CO2, whatever else we can get. But our last wars were fought not over food, but over energy. Japan wanted the oil from Java, and they took it. Germany wanted to annex the oil fields of Romania and they took them. But they wasted the treasure and the blood because they failed. And free trade today makes it possible for people to count on being able to buy what they can't produce. And that free trade must be ensured along with our continued progress in agricultural research. Thank you.